Hello my friends, and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 character building guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to be going over every subclass in Baldur's Gate in part 2 of my t class tier list series, so if you haven't seen part 1 where I went over the classes, go check that out. And we'll be discussing in detail their strengths and weaknesses, how they fit into a party, how you use them in a party, and what draws you to play that subclass. As in my last video, it's worth mentioning that the margins between these tiers will be very thin. Every single class and subclass in this game is viable, you can win honor mode with any of these classes, and so your primary consideration when you're picking a character should always be what do you want to play, what do you think is going to be the most fun. I'm definitely not here to stop you from playing what you want to play, and you'll often see video guides that say this is the only way to play Baldur's Gate 3, I'm here to tell you those guides are wrong. Every single one of these classes is viable and we have to be proceeding from the assumption that we are working off of a very strong baseline when we're trying to discuss the differences between them. So it's very important that we start from the assumption that these are all good subclasses, and that will help us understand how to rate them when we're rating the differences between them. In this video, we'll be discussing these characters as monoclasses, so 12 levels of this subclass and how good those are for honor mode specifically, although of course all of this information can be used in lower difficulty settings. I think it is worth discussing things for honor mode because you can always reason out from the specific cases to the more general cases, um, and that's also why I wanted to cover the subclasses as monoclasses, because I think it's very important to have a solid grounding in these characters before we start talking about multi-class characters in future installments. I want to thank the people who suggested this in the comments of my previous video, by the way. I think this order does make more sense, so I appreciate that suggestion and have taken it. Two other assumptions that I'm going to be making when rating these characters are, one, that you're not abusing any bugs. I think that's a very reasonable assumption, so we're going to be uh, proceeding from the assumption that you are playing the game without any particular bug abuse, and two, that you are probably not intending to long rest after every single fight, so how long a character can keep going during a day will way into my considerations. I'll be rating the subclasses both on their power level, their raw power level they bring to the table, and on their versatility, as in how easy is it to fit this character into a party, um, how many different ways can you build it, and how easy it, is it to uh, build a party around maximizing its strengths, and also just in general how easy is it to play, can you afford to make play mistakes when playing these characters. I think a lot of times people will ignore those other factors, but I think they're very important to decide uh, the factors of versatility. I think it's very important to pay attention to those when you're deciding how to build your party. However, because the subclasses have more restrictive roles than the base classes, for obvious reasons, I will be considering power level more heavily when rating the subclasses, so we'll be weighing things more towards the power level end of the scale than the versatility end of the scale. Before I begin rating things, I also do want to take a quick moment to say thank you so much to Yams for the $2 donation, Dolores Abernathy for the $2, William Spencer for the $20, and Peter Brand and Josh Hobbs for becoming channel members. Thank you so much, my friends. I really do appreciate the support. It means a lot. Finally, let's go over these tiers and what they mean so that we're all on the same page before we start. I've decided to divide the subclasses into six different tiers, um, because there's a lot of subclasses, and so I think that's a very useful division. In S plus tier, I have characters that are out of scale for the balancing in Dungeons & Dragons. So these subclasses, usually because Larian has updated them from their tabletop versions in a way that sort of breaks the game balance, are inherently too strong for this game. They, the abilities that they get break the game balance in a way that is probably not intended to fit within the normal balance of Dungeons & Dragons. And so in Baldur's Gate 3, these classes are too powerful for the normal state of game balance. I'm going to be using the, this category quite restrictively. I believe there are only two subclasses that fall into it, although I might discover more as we go through, um, but this is for ones that are actually out of scale with how strong a class or subclass is supposed to be. In S tier, we have characters that are extremely powerful and versatile. These are characters that both have very high raw power level and fit easily into any party. They are going to give you a ton of value and will use 
usually be the core component of any honor mode party are going to be some of these S tier subclasses. In A tier, we have very solid characters that ha gain very strong subclass benefits, as well as having solid uh, class chassis, and the, they will give you a ton of value as well. Although usually an A tier character is either slightly harder to fit into a party in terms of versatility, or slightly less raw power than an S tier character. Usually they'll be S tier in one of the two categories, but only but slightly weaker in the other of the two categories, and that will put them into A tier. In B tier, we have characters that are typically more restrictive, uh, so they're usually only built one way, and generally will that way is not as powerful as the S tier. Um, Typically, these are going to be classes that are either highly restrictive in sort of how they're built, they're very greedy for items, they require you to build your party around it, or only add one thing to the party. Often that thing is still very good, and I do want to, again, emphasize that the margins between these tiers are very thin, and B-tier characters are still great characters, but they are going to be... Uh, slightly more restrictive and not give you quite as much as the S or A tier characters. And in C tier we have characters that are difficult to fit into a party because they they probably just don't pull their weight as much. Again, these are still totally viable, but often will need some more party support from a stronger character in another party slot in order to maximize the potential of this character because they are the inherent strengths of the subclass just don't quite manage it. And finally, in the the final tier, which I'm calling the outclassed tier, I have subclasses that are fulfill exactly the same role as another subclass in their same class. So they do exactly the same thing as another subclass, but worse. And so they're sort of strictly dominated by those choices, and there's never any reason to pick this subclass because another subclass just does the same thing better. Obviously, other than the overriding reason of, I think it sounds cool and I want to play it. But from a mechanical standpoint, these classes are just worse than another option within their class. So let's begin talking about the subclasses, beginning with barbarian subclasses. I should also mention, I didn't mention this in my previous video, but something I should mention is that this video format where we're talking about solo class characters, uh, single class characters, is unfair to barbarians because other than rogues, they're the class that most benefits from multiclassing. So barbarians are ranking artificially a little bit lower than they will when we start talking about these characters as part of multiclasses because we're talking about single class characters. A primary example of this is going to be Berserker Barbarian, because Berserker Barbarian uh, gets two main things and then a third useless class feature. You get Frenzy, which allows you to make a bonus action attack while raging, or a bonus action throw while raging. Remember the throw part, it'll be important. If you make this bonus action attack as an attack, you take Frenzied Strain, reducing your future attack rolls by one for the rest of combat, and that penalty stacks. So in long combats, if you continuously use this bonus action attack, you won't be hitting very accurately. However, if you use the bonus action throw, you don't take the Frenzied Strain penalty, meaning that thrown weapon Berserker Barbarians can continue to make extra attacks and effectively just get three attacks per round of combat because they get to use their bonus action on an attack. Um, however, this takes their, their bonus action, and as a solo class Barbarian, you have no other ways of getting additional bonus actions or extra attacks, so you'll reach three attacks per round but never ending more as a solo class character. Throne Weapon Fighters or Throne Weapon Barbarians are one of the most powerful strategies in Baldur's Gate because the Tavern Brawler feat is broken. Um, <laughs> that's another piece of slightly poor design that shouldn't have made it into the game in its current state, but basically it doubles all of your to hit and damage rolls with Throne Weapons, meaning that a Berserker Barbarian using Throne Weapons is going to be hitting, more, uh, hitting harder and more accurately than just about any other character in the game. You also get Mindless Rage, which makes you immune while raging to fear and charm effects, allowing you to have get away with lower wisdom compared to other martial characters, because many of the most debilitating fear, uh, debilitating wisdom targeting effects are fears or charms, which you'll be immune to starting at level 6. You also get intimidating presence, which we can just ignore, it's, it's not useful. Um, so that means that a Berserker Barbarian, if built for throwing, is one of the 
the most consistent and most powerful damage dealers in the game. However, we do have to compare them to the other main throne weapon character, Eldritch Knights. And they, unfortunately, as monoclass characters, do suffer a little bit in comparison. A throwing weapon Eldritch Knight at the similar levels, is at, at max level, gets three throws per action and can action surge to make six throws in their first round of combat. A thrown weapon barbarian at max level gets uh, two throws in their first round of combat, because you have to spend your bonus action raging, and then three throws every subsequent round of combat. So you will just be making fewer attacks than your Eldritch Knight equivalent. Now, those attacks are better because you have rage damage, which you add to them. You can use reckless attack to gain advantage on those throws if you melee attack something with reckless attack and then make subsequent throws. And the bonus action throws will also knock enemies over. Having a bonus action throw is also just really powerful in and of itself because you can use it to, um, as it sort of presumably the design intent was to use it to throw enemies, you can still do that. You can use it to throw potions to your allies or bombs at your enemies. Ironically, the, the most common use of the bonus action throw that isn't just throwing a weapon is probably throwing a bottle of water to set things up for your allies' lightning spells, but that is a very powerful use of a bonus action throw, so you get some utility there. Overall, this character is going to be doing a ton of damage, but when compared to the fighter version of the thrown weapon character as a monoclass character, I want to emphasize that, you do fall behind. I'm going to say it's still just a, a very solid character, so I'm going to put it in A tier. Um, and in terms of power level, it's probably... Uh, right up there with all the S tier characters, but the fact that there is just a better version of the thrown weapon uh, damage dealer available for mono class characters as an Eldritch Knight fighter, I think does hold back the um, Berserker Barbarian a little bit. Wildheart Barbarian. Wildheart Barbarians get two main things. They get a random effect that triggers whenever they rage, and they get the ability to restore allied spell slots. So you would think they would work pretty well with allied spellcasters. However, there's something that kind of holds them back from working well with allied spellcasters, despite being able to... to give them new spell slots, because you don't want to activate your Wildheart Rage while near your party. One of the random, or a couple of the random effects do damage to creatures around you, and so you don't want to activate these while near your party, which makes it actually more difficult for your party's positioning to work around field effects that your spellcaster allies might place, and also you don't want to activate Rage while trying to defend allies. This isn't a huge consideration, but it does it means there's some inbuilt anti-synergy to the class. One thing that is nice for Wild Magic Barbarian for Honor Mode, though, is that there are no negative Wild Magic effects. Unlike Wild Magic Sorcerer, the Wild Magic Barbarian cannot ruin your life if you, as long as you make sure to rage at least 20 feet away from your party members. You will never have a, a major negative effect happen, and so you can always count on your Wild mag Magic Barbarian doing something good. However, they don't get anything that's particularly special compared to the other Barbarian effects. None of the, the random magic effects are Way are to, or to compared to the other barbarian rage effects. Uh, none of the random magic effects are wildly powerful, and because they're random, they are much, much less reliable, obviously, than the bar the rage effects of the berserker or wild heart barbarians, where you know what you're getting every time and can plan around it. The ability to restore spell slots is okay and does give you a slightly increased adventuring uh, day, but they're low-level spell slots and you don't get to do it that often, so it's really not that huge a benefit. Um, and overall, I think that the Wild Magic Barbarian, the effects are relatively minor from your rages. You, you just don't get anything that's going to completely win a fight at random, and I feel like you would need an effect that was strong enough to just instantly end a fight. Um, in order to justify taking random effects a lot of the time, because not being able to plan around them makes your tactical positioning much harder. Um, Wild Magic Barbarian is still a barbarian, which is still just a great thing to be. You do a lot of damage and are very tanky, but as a subclass, it does not give you anything that's particularly better than the other two classes, although the ability to restore allied uh, allied spell slots is worth taking. However, I think overall Wild Magic Barbarian belongs in C tier. It is um, just compared to the other two classes, does not give you other two subclasses, doesn't really give you anything that they don't and gives you a lot of or makes your 
game a little bit harder to play because you have to move your martial character away from your allies before raging every time, which means it's harder for them to protect each other, harder for them to play around buffs and, and field effects from your allies, um, and, and that does restrict your level of play. Uh, as a as a monoclass character, Wild Magic Barbarian also just doesn't really get too much in terms of gains as you level up. You get to restore better spell slots, but other than that, you aren't doing anything that it, that you weren't doing right from the beginning of the game. And so as you level up as a solo class character, Wild Magic Barbarian doesn't improve that much, and you definitely want your subclasses to keep getting better as you level up. Wild Heart. Wild Heart has five different possible modes, and luckily they're all really good. You can get really tanky by taking Bear Heart, you can one-shot enemies with Eagle Heart, you can gain additional AoE damage and lockdown with Tiger Heart, support melee allies with Wolf Heart, and gain additional movement with Elk Heart. So all of those are incredibly strong abilities. Um, Bear Heart is the most usual one to take because having all incoming damage is incredibly powerful, but all of them can fit easily into a party. Tiger Heart Barbarians have the distinction of probably being the best great weapon master users in the game because their AoE attack allows you to apply your great weapon master uh, bonus damage more often and or to uh, to more enemies at once, which obviously is incredibly powerful. And so, as a two-handed weapon fighter, the the wild heart barbarian is incredibly strong. These actually, I think, are overall better at the two-handed fighter playstyle than Berserker Barbarians, because Berserker Barbarians, if they're actually attacking in melee with their bonus attacks, um, suffer from Frenzied Strain, which does add up, whereas Wild Heart Barbarians get only benefits, and so a Tiger Heart Barbarian that's hitting two or more enemies is making the same number of attacks as a Berserker Barbarian, or even more if they keep going, um, but not suffering Frenzied Strain and giving bleed to enemies and everything as well. So in general, if you want to make your Barbarian a melee two-hander, and so if you're building sort of lore-friendly Karlak, for example, you're probably going to want to make a, a Wild Heart Barbarian for that character, because I think it will give you the easiest way to do the highest possible damage output with your two-handed weapon. Wild Heart Barbarian just gives you a lot of things. They continue to get good bonuses as you level up, with their level 6 abilities also all being solid. The Elk Aura that just gives your entire party plus 5 foot of movement speed is a great default if you don't want any of the others in particular, but there's lots of different builds you can do with all of them. Um, but, you know, a 5 foot move speed aura for your whole party is already just a really nice class feature to get. So all of the... the Wild Hearts are really good. You also get Land Stride Difficult Terrain, which means you combo really well with a bunch of other ground targeting effects like Spike Growth and whatever. So at, at level 8, you can be immune to Spike Growth, which is very valuable. Overall, Wild Heart Barbarians, I think, are just the the most solid class in the game, probably. Most solid subclass in the game. You will never be let down by them. They won't usually do anything that's out of scale power-wise or massively... Too, uh, too incredibly spectacular, but you will never be sad to have a Wild Heart Barbarian. I think they're the very definition of an A-tier character. Bard subclasses. So I rated Bard as an S-tier character in S-tier class, so we're working off the basis of an S-tier chassis already, um, but let's take a look at the individual subclasses, starting with College of Lore. College of Lore, I have to admit, there is some bias here because it is my favorite subclass in Dungeons and Dragons. I've probably played a lore bard for just about as many hours as anybody on the planet because I've done a lore bard in two multi-year long uh, tabletop campaigns and it was my first Baldur's Gate character that I, I played through the game with and then I played it again in honor mode. Um, so I've probably spent as much time playing lore bards as literally anyone on earth. Uh, lore bards get cutting words, giving you a reaction that allows you to uh, reduce by your inspiration die enemy attacks, which is an incredibly powerful effect. You can think of it basically as a shield spell that you can cast on any of your allies. Shield is pro is like top five spells in the game, and having it be available to cast on all of your allies is of course incredible, um, as well as y using the normal uses of bardic inspiration. You also get magical secrets at level six, so you get your you get additional spells, um, and you get expertise or you get proficiency in three additional skills when you select Lorebard. So you get 
better skill access than any other character in the game on top of the better skill access than any character in the game that Bard's already got. Um, and you get a shield spell that you can cast on all of your allies several times per day, in addition to all of the other Bard goodies. And you get the best spell access of any character in the game through Magical Secrets. Getting that at level 6 means that you can take some of the most important and powerful spells and have them through basically the entire uh, game at you, you're only delayed one level on Counterspell, Hunger of Hadar, Haste, compared to the classes that actually get them. And of course, you also get all of your bard spells. Um, overall, I think that their lore bards have basically no downsides. They're kind of the default bard choice. If you're playing a spellcaster bard, lore bards are going to be be incredible at what they do. Um, you can build them for support, you can build them for control casting, you can have them build them for healing, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with them through access to magical secrets, even outside of just getting all the best spells in the game through magical secrets, the most rawly powerful spells in the game through magical secrets. You also can build a, them in a ton of cool different ways. And of course, like all other bards, they give you all the dialogue skills. I think it would be very silly to place lore bards not in S tier. Swords bards. Swords Bards get medium armor proficiency, which is really nice on a spellcaster. It just gives you good AC for a spellcaster, and they get a whole bunch of weapon-focused abilities. Sword Bards get slashing flourishes, or get flourishes, although slashing flourish is the, the most important one, but they are all relevant. They give you your inspiration die to damage on the attack and some bonus abilities. The most important one for what we're going to be discussing is slashing flourish, because this allows you to make two attacks, and if with a ranged weapon, it just allows you to attack twice with that attack action. Um, each of those attacks then gets the additional inspiration die to damage, so effectively Swords Bards get four attacks per action compared to every other character's two attacks per action when using a ranged weapon. Um, obvi they also do get extra attack like other martial characters, but of course also get all of the full spellcasting abilities that bards already have. And so in addition to being one of the better spellcasting classes in the game, just getting full spellcasting access, they also get the most weapon attacks of any character in the game thanks to Slashing Flourish. You can do this many times per day because at uh, bard level 5, your inspiration dice come back on a short rest, and you get them them back. They get a damage steroid, because you add your inspiration die to damage. And if it weren't enough that they just got more attacks and had better spells than every other character, they also, as a result, get access to the most broken item combo in the game, the Helm of Arcane Acuity plus the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel, because if you are making lots of weapon attacks, you're stacking up your Arcane Acuity, and then you can make a bonus action spell cast to cast a control spell on on an, on an enemy. Uh, one of the control spells that's available with the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel is Hold Person, because that's an enchantment spell, and Hold Person then guarantees criticals with all your subsequent attacks. Even without that abusive combo, though, Swords Bards just get too much. Um, they get... Uh, great defenses because they get medium armor proficiency and you can grab shield proficiency from your race so they will have some of the best AC in the game. They get some of the best spell casting in the game because they're bards. They get all the support abilities that bards already get. They get extra attack and they get two extra and they get multiple extra attacks every single round with the flourish attacks even discounting the other flourishes which come up sometimes. Just the ability to make four attacks per round is frankly, nonsense. Uh, swords bards were changed to be able to make the ranged... Uh, the, the flourishes were changed from the tabletop version of swords bards. They don't work at all at range in tabletop, and so... Baldur's Gate 3 added the ranged flourishes, um, which is kind of part of the problem, but also buffed all of the flourishes significantly, and so you... they have taken what should be sort of a minor benefit to let you be a swashbuckling swordsman in addition to being a full caster, and turned it into basically being the best martial class and the best spellcasting class, all rolled into one class, and that's before even considering the broken item combos that this class gets to abuse better than any other class. This class is simply out of scale with the intended game balance of the game. Um, as an archer making four attacks per round, you also get all the damage steroids. Like, they, they don't even... Uh, have fewer damage steroids than other archer characters because the main archery damage steroid is sharpshooter, which you can take as a feat. You just get as get access to it just like every other archer, and just making multiple attacks per round is the best way to apply sharpshooter, so you're just better at doing damage and better uh, than 
actually dedicated damage classes are also a full spellcaster, are also the tankiest character in the game, or have some of the easiest access to high AC in the game. Um, obviously, this is an S plus tier character, and I personally think that it should not have been released in this state because it is out of scale with the intended balance of Dungeons and Dragons. Obviously, it's still super fun to play, um, and and you know, like that that matters more than balance by far. But I think that the the way that they've built Swords Bard, it does too many things and is too powerful as a subclass. Valor Bard. Valor Bards also get medium armor and shields, uh, and they also get martial weapon access, which is kind of nice, although bards already get access to rapiers and most of the good bows, so it's probably not a huge increase to your, your damage output. Um, and they get combat inspiration, allowing an inspired ally to add their inspiration die to armor class, which is basically the same as a cutting words, or to damage, which is kind of the same as a slashing, as a as a sword bard flourish. Um, however, the difference between combat inspiration as a defensive measure and cutting words is that you have to apply it proactively. You need to choose which ally is going to have the inspiration, and then they and then they have to get attacked. Um, whereas the Lore Bard gets to choose reactively based on which ally has been attacked. Uh, Valor Bards also get extra attack at level 6, but don't have any damage increase the way Swords Bards do, so they will be doing significantly less damage. Um, and overall, and the ability to add your combat inspiration die to damage is not a huge factor. There are probably some party comps you could do where you're adding that to a critical hit on an ally and then multiplying to, you know, if you have an ally who somehow guarantees a critical hit, you could give it to an assassin rogue, then that assassin rogue could uh, guarantee a critical hit with their combat inspiration die and double the damage. That's pretty thin, though. And Swords Bard already gets to double it with Slashing Flourish, already gets to apply twice their combat, their inspiration die to damage anyways, uh, and then even more if they actually critical hit. Overall, Valor Bard doesn't do anything that Sword Bard doesn't do way, way better. Uh, you don't get any spellcasting abilities that Lore Bard doesn't get better. You don't get any combat abilities that Swords Bard doesn't get better. Overall, there's no particular reason to take a Valor Bard. Obviously, you're still a Bard, and that's still a great thing to be, so it can be a totally viable character if if you want to roleplay for or whatever reason, or just feel dirty picking Swords Bard. Um, but from a mechanical standpoint, there's just no reason to take a Valor Bard. I will also say that the way to fix Valor Bard is just to nerf Swords Bard. Uh, I, I, I think that Valor Bard could maybe use like one more ability, but the real problem here is just that Sword Bard does everything they do but better. Clerics. Clerics are an S tier class. Remember, I rated the base class as S tier, so all of these subclasses are starting from a very high bar. Cleric subclasses give you a bunch of abilities, multiple abilities throughout your adventure, throughout your levels, but also additional spell access, and the spells that you get are always prepared. One of the best things that cleric domains give you is spells that aren't on the cleric spell list, giving you access to additional spells. And so one of the main strengths of these domains is comes from spells that you wouldn't normally have access to that are very high tier spells that are going to be a core part of your strategy. Some of these domains will give you spells that I've rated, you know, S tier on my spells tier list, and that will give you some idea of how good it is to have access to those spells in addition to Cleric's already excellent spell list. Let's begin by talking about the Knowledge Domain Cleric, who gets a few different abilities. The first, and or the most important, is Knowledge of the Ages, which lets you spend your channel divinity to gain proficiency in every skill of a specific ability until your next long rest. It's the same as the Gith Yankee racial ability. And this actually makes Knowledge Clerics quite versatile. One of the things that holds clerics back, typically, is that they have very bad skill access. You don't want to take uh, ad you, you don't want to take a lot of attribute points in the in the categories that give you important skills, mostly clerics don't want to build charisma, so they're not going to be good at dialogue skills usually. But a knowledge cleric can take a, a reasonable amount of charisma. You can just like have 12 charisma and then gain proficiency in all the dialogue skills, and suddenly your cleric can be a party face if that's something that you're interested in. Or a knowledge cleric with decent dexterity, and you're incentivized to give them decent dexterity because they're a medium armor character, can be your lockpicking character just by using knowledge of the ages to gain proficiency in uh, deck skills. You can also, if you don't get it from your race, gain proficiency in perception just by picking wisdom skills with your knowledge of the ages. So it makes knowledge clerics quite versatile. And remember, you can actually switch this 
if you need uh, from day to day if you need to make different skill checks on that day. You also get a few spells that aren't on the cleric spell list, most notably Confusion, Telekinesis, and uh, Slow. Slow is a pretty nice debuff to have. You also get Sleep, which is not terrible to have in the early game, but not a huge uh, bonus. But mostly these are spells that are going to be slightly less powerful versions of control spells that you already have. Getting Confusion at level 4 is pretty nice because clerics don't otherwise have a great AoE uh, control spell at 4th level. Um, so at, or at 7th level, at 7th character level, 4th level spells. But overall that spell list isn't super inspiring. Potent spell casting gives you additional damage on your cleric cantrips, which is mostly irrelevant by that point in the game. Um, although there's probably some cool builds you could do with it. But overall what you're getting from Knowledge Cleric is just skill access. I think that Knowledge Cleric not giving you heavy armor and just giving you the better skill access is nice. And you it, it's very hard to rate a cleric uh, subclass lower than A tier. So I think this is an A tier character um, just because clerics are already so in inherently powerful. But they are uh, not getting a ton from Knowledge Cleric other than skill access. Life Cleric. Life Cleric gets abilities that are all focused around healing. They get zero new spells from their domain list, they get no spells that aren't on the cleric domain list already, but they get a bunch of powerful healing-focused class features. Firstly, they get heavy armor, which is nice because it means you're not competing for medium armor, so that's always great. And secondly, they gain additional healing from all of their healing spells. They gain an AoE channel divinity heal, which lets them heal for three times their character level in an AoE. And at later levels when they heal an ally, they also heal themselves. They also get divine strike doing extra damage on melee attacks, but they are not a melee attacking class, so you can pretty safely ignore that. In general, what Life Cleric gives you is the ability to apply the buff on heal items better than any other solo class. Um, they The Channel Divinity lets you AoE apply those without spending a level 3 spell slot. Normally you're going to apply the, the buff on healing items, the Blade Ward and Bless, um, items with mass cure wound, or mass healing word, which takes a bonus action and hits your whole party and applies them. Life Domain Cleric can do it more times per day, although as an action rather than a bonus action. But also they double up on healing themselves and healing allies with all their spells, meaning they're applying with a single action or a single healing word those buffs to an ally and to themselves. That means that basically all of the power budget of this class is built into that one item set, or if the subclass is built into that one item set. And that is a very good item set and a very good thing to be doing. It's a very powerful strategy, but it is quite one-dimensional, so you don't necessarily need it in your party if you don't need a healer. Obviously, as a cleric, they are still an extremely strong class, but they suffer a little bit from the monoclass restriction because um, Life Cleric is one of the best one-level dips in the game. But as a mono class, gaining no new spell access and giving you abilities that all center around applying the buff on healing items and the best way to do that is still just Healing Word, which any Cleric subclass can do. I think that uh, Life Clerics are still an A-tier character, because they do give you a powerful dimension to add the buff on, on healing items, of course, and they're a Cleric, so there's only so... Uh, they, they're very strong. Uh, and I know that this take is going to make people, some folks mad, who really love their Life Clerics, and I say more power to you. But overall, as a solo class character, Life Cleric does not give you that much compared to the other uh, Cleric domains, so A-tier. Light Cleric. Light Cleric gets a bunch of direct damage spells uh, that clerics don't normally get. So they get like fire, uh, Fireball, Wall of Fire, Flame Strike, or Destructive Wave, excuse me, uh, Flaming Sphere, Scorching Ray. Just a bunch of good damage spells that you can add to your arsenal. And clerics normally do lack direct damage spells. So Light Cleric fills a hole in the cleric spell list through their domain spells, which is what you want. They also get extremely powerful domain abilities. At level one, they get Warding Flare, which is basically um, you, a reaction to give an enemy disadvantage on attacking you. Uh, disadvantage on an attack against you is very slightly worse than a shield spell, but overall will be about like minus four-ish, a little more than minus four on most average enemy attacks or most ACs uh, to the attack of an enemy, meaning that you are going to convert a lot of hits into misses using Warding Flare. Um, and at level six, they can apply it to anyone in the party. This is basically uh, the equivalent of 
Lorebard's Cutting Words, which is, in my opinion, one of the most powerful abilities in the game. Getting a shield spell that you can cast on your entire party based on who's getting attacked is incredibly powerful, and of course that comes with all of the normal cleric support stuff. And also at level 2 they get Radiance of the Dawn, which is a channel divinity action that does 2d10 plus your character level radiant damage to hostile creatures only in a giant AoE. 2d10 plus 2 damage at level 2 is the biggest AoE nuke in the game, um, and remains quite relevant for a long time. Of course, this is also radiant damage, so it applies radiant orb effects and everything, which light, cler or light clerics are as they should be, the best at applying, and that's an incredibly powerful strategy. Every single ability that light clerics get, their spell uh, get is awesome. Their spell list is good. Not the best domain spell list, but definitely a nice one to have. Will give you a bunch of additional options for solving encounters. Let your cleric play both just uh, a control caster and support caster, but also just a pure damage caster, and gives you one of the most powerful defensive abilities in the game. Light cleric is obviously S tier. Nature Clerics. Nature Clerics get to pick a Druid cantrip, which is usually going to be Shillelagh because um, that will allow you to actually function as a melee character in the early game. With a Torch plus Shillelagh, you're going to be doing better melee damage than any other character at level 1, and so for the first couple levels, you can be a totally reasonable melee combatant, and the first like two levels are a Cleric's weakest point in the game anyways, so having that ability to uh, to act as a reasonable melee combatant in the early game before the martial characters start taking over that, that role does give you a little bit of an extra boost to your, your party because you will have just the, the nature cleric going to be pulling their weight doing damage in the very early game. And then you also get one of the best spell lists in the game in terms of additional spell access. You get Spike Growth, an excellent spell. Sleet Storm, another excellent spell. Uh, Grasping Vine, which I now think is a very good spell thanks to the buffs, and adds a really fun extra dimension to cleric uh, spell casting because clerics have a lot of AoE abilities that you want to keep people in. Grasping Vine can help you do that. Um, but mostly it's just about getting uh, Sleet Storm, one of the best control spells in the game, Plant Growth, one of the best control spells in the game, and Spike Growth, another top tier spell that also fills a hole that in the cleric spell list. Nature Cleric's spell access is great. The ability to gain additional or Heavy armor is great. Shillelagh for the early game is really nice. You also get Dampen Elements, which at level 6 lets you have incoming damage from an elemental attack, which is very good. This also stacks with normal resistance, so if you have a, a an elemental resistance, you can quarter incoming damage. But the ability to have incoming damage from a spell that an ally took from like a burst damage spell, a lightning bolt or whatever, that you got struck by, can save you a lot of HP. The ability to do that reactively is pretty nice. This isn't like the best class feature in the game or anything, but it will come up a few times during the course of your play and be very useful when it does. Anything that's reactive like that is always worth considering. And just the fact that Nature Cleric gives you a bunch of excellent spells to add to Cleric's already formidable arsenal of spells, I think makes them an S tier subclass. Tempest Clerics. So Tempest Clerics get probably the single best uh, additional spell list of any of the Cleric domains. They get some of the best spells in the game in Fog Cloud, Sleet Storm, Hail Storm, or Ice Storm, excuse me, uh, Call Lightning, Destructive Wrath, just a laundry list of a bunch of great spells added to the Cleric spell list, all of which also fill holes in the Cleric spell list that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. So just an excellent set of spells to add to your Cleric's arsenal. Um, in addition to that, they also get Heavy Armor and Martial Weapon Proficiency. Martial Weapon Proficiency, not that relevant, but Heavy Armor of course is great to add to clerics and you get uh, destructive wrath so once per channel divinity you can maximize lightning damage that you're dealing for the a mono class tempest cleric by default this isn't a huge boon because you don't get uh, lightning bolt you don't get chain lightning you don't get witch bolt or chromatic orb so you're not maximizing some of the the most damaging lightning spells in the game but even maximizing call lightning can still be really good um, and of course you can maximize things like mark a Heshkir damage if you are going to put that on your tempest cleric which of course if you're taking a tempest cleric you should probably consider maximizing damage is incredible obviously because it increases your damage your average damage 
significantly, but also because you know exactly how much damage it's going to do. So even just the ability to say, I that enemy is at 28 hit points, I will do a, an exactly 30 damage chain light, or call lightning to them and guarantee killing them if they fail the save, is extremely valuable and reduces the number of dice you have to roll. The enemy of optimization, as I'm very fond of saying, is randomness. So anything that removes randomness from the equation, and Tempest Cleric does that very well, is always worth looking at. In addition, Tempest Clerics also get the ability to use a reaction when something takes lightning damage, or when uh, an, an enemy attacks you, you can use your reaction to do damage to them, um, lightning or thunder damage. And then uh, l at level 6, when you deal lightning or thunder damage to an enemy, you can also push them. So you can use your reaction to push an enemy away when they attack you. But more importantly, if you, for example, electrify a field of water, that will count as you doing lightning damage to them. And the thunderbolt strike that pushes enemies doesn't require your reaction to use. It, it just happens every time an enemy takes damage from them. So an enemy running across an electrified field of water created by a Tempest Cleric is going to get Get, like ping ponged around the map it is an incredible that which is an incredible uh, additional crowd control effect added to your already excellent crowd control effects that you get by virtue of your incredible spell list from your domain spells and from being a cleric and your great class features you do also get the extra 1d8 thunder damage on attacks again for clerics who aren't really melee attackers this isn't a huge deal but tempest clerics both by virtue of their incredible spell list and by virtue of their incredible class features are of course an s tier s tier class trickery clerics Trickery clerics get um, some spells that aren't on the cleric spell list, the most notable one being fear. In fact, I think the only really notable one is fear. I guess pass without trace is okay uh, if you're building a specifically a greater invisibility strategy. But other than that, fear is the only good one that they get. They get medi they're stuck with medium armor, so no additional proficiencies. And they get Blessing of the Trickster to give an ally advantage on stealth checks. Basically useless, because it's concentration, so you'd rather cast Pass Without Trace. Um, and Invoke Duplicity, which is one of the most insulting abilities in the game. Um, I love Invoke Duplicity in Tabletop, so I'm still bitter about this one, by the way. Because in Tabletop, you can cast spells through your Invoke Duplicity creature, so you can use it to, like, uh, illusion. You can use it to cast spells around corners. Also, it's an actual illusion, so enemies will um, go after it. Whereas in Baldur's Gate, they've implemented it as an action and concentration that costs your channel divinity a twice-per-day resource, a once-per-day resource for half the game, twice-per-day resource for the other half the game, um, to give you advantage on... Uh, Weapon, or give allies within 10 feet of it advantage on enemies within 10 feet of it. So you have to place it next to an ally and next to an enemy and gain advantage so long as you concentrate on it and waste your entire action casting the, the ability. Having this ability is literally worse than not having it because sometimes it might trick you into casting it by accident. Um, I think you can actually see this in my honor mode playthrough where I'm like, oh, here's a place where, where trickery domains uh, invoke duplicity might come up and then I forget that it's concentration because why is it concentration and break bless on the trickery domain and and break my concentration on bless by casting it um other than that you get no relevant abilities at all so basically trickery domain the only thing that it gives you is fear in addition to the other uh, other than just being a default cleric, the only relevant thing that it gives you is the spell Fear. That is something that is useful, but overall, um, many of the other cleric subclasses provide AoE control spells, and Fear is not better enough than Sleet Storm or whatever to, to make me judge it as being worth taking over those things. So anything that your trickery cleric is going to be doing, uh, another cleric subclass would simply do better. War clerics. War clerics are most often seen as a one level dip, but I think the subclass actually gives you quite a lot if you take multiple levels in it. So we're going to talk about it as, of course, as a solo class and uh, what it actually gives you. The spell list is nothing special. It gives you a few things that aren't normally on the... Um, 
aren't normally on the cleric spell list, but the most notable one of those is Crusader's Mantle. If you're doing specifically a mass summoning build, um, you can use Crusader's Mantle to give your summons additional damage. Other than that, you just don't get anything that's particularly good. Uh, you get a lot of low tier spells. However, you get additional attacks a few times per day, um, which you can make as a bonus action, and you get the ability to add 10 to your attack roll uh, as a as a reaction once per channel divinity charge. And then at level 6, you can add 10 to an ally attack roll once per reaction. Now, uh, adding 10 to an ally attack roll is a massive bonus. The, the ability to turn a miss into a hit is incredible. Your war cleric probably won't be hitting that often, to be honest. Uh, even with the additional, at, at max level, you get five additional war uh, bonus action attacks per day. You're still just going to be primarily a spellcaster. But um, the ability to turn a miss into a hit for an ally is a really nice ability. That being said, the War Cleric doesn't buff itself that much. The The actual War Cleric attacks are not terribly useful for a monoclass Cleric. They're incredibly useful for multi-class builds, of course. Um, but your monoclass Cleric is just not going to keep up in damage in, in, in as a War Cleric uh, version of the build compared to any class with extra attack, like a real extra attack feature. Um, but the ability to turn misses into hits for allies is really strong, even only a couple times per day. Um, overall, I think this is still just an A tier class. You're getting heavy armor and martial weapon weapons is really nice. Uh, getting the ability to turn misses into hits is really good, but other than that, you're not getting anything super special from this character uh, in terms of spell list access or anything like that. Still just a great cleric subclass and an A-tier class in general. Druid. So I rated Druid as a an A-tier character on my previous class list, although I do think that they're probably near the top end of A-tier on that list. I guess also one good way to think about the list here is that a, a class with no a, subclass abilities would probably show up on this list at one tier lower than where most of the subclasses are showing up. So a druid on this list would probably, with no subclass abilities at all, would probably show up in B tier. A barbarian on, on this list with no subclass abilities at all would probably show up in C tier. So that'll give you some idea of sort of how the tiers translate from one list to another. I probably should have mentioned that in the intro, but I just kind of thought of uh, it as, we, as I was going through that that is how those tiers have kind of shaken out to be. For druid subclasses, they actually, druids are really interesting because I think they have three extremely powerful and viable subclasses. Like, they're all just good subclasses overall. Um, and they are also one of the classes that has the most distinct playstyles between their three subclasses. So each of those is really interesting to rate as a class in and of itself. Land Druid, which we're of course going to start with, is the spellcasting druid. You get a lot of additional spell access, and you can choose your spell access based on what your party needs by picking different circles. Um, you also get additional uh, natural recovery charges, which give you additional spells per day, so that it slightly increases your longevity in terms of, uh, of number of spells that you can cast per day. And you gain additional spell access based on what circles you pick. You also get immunity to difficult terrain and later on immunity to poison, um, which is uh, poison and disease, which is pretty relevant because a lot of your spells can create poison and disease, which you're then immune to. You can stand in your own cloud kill safely while enemies have to stand in the cloud kill to, to get to you. That's a very relevant class ability. The spell access that you get from the circles of the land circles are some of the best spells in the game, particularly at low levels. You get things like Misty Step, Haste, or Hypnotic Pattern, um, just some of the best possible spells in the game to have additional access to. They, the selection gets a little weaker as you level up, but that's also when Druid spells are at their strongest. Druids have some of the better 4th and 5th level spells in the game, so not getting as good spells with your level 7 and level 9 circle selection doesn't matter as much to you as it would to another character because you your base spells are so good already, and the land druid spells can fill holes in your spell list earlier on by giving you uh, haste, you know, powerful buffs like haste or misty step, which gives you a lot of mobility. 
Land Druid doesn't get anything regarding Wild Shapes, so you just have the default Druid Wild Shapes, but you're probably going to be spending some of your time in humanoid form because you're going to be casting a lot of spells. That being said, that does conflict a little with the core playstyle of Druid, which is usually to cast a concentration spell, a powerful concentration spell, and then swap to Wild Shape. So Land Druid will often have a slightly awkward set of turns because you want to be using the powerful spell access that you get. There's a lot of really cool builds you can do with Land Druid. As a mono class uh, character, I think that they do fall off a little bit in the late game because their their spell access is uh, somewhat D does get a little bit worse compared to some other characters, although, of course, druid base spells are really good. I think they're just a very solid A-tier character class. Just a, just a great class to be. Um, by default, I think, if you want a druid, just play a, a land druid because it's the sort of most spellcast... If you want a spellcasting druid, just play a land druid. It's the most spellcasting druid, and you'll be able to fill any holes that you want to fill in your party by taking the correct spells from your circles. Moon Druid. Moon Druids get a bunch of additional wild shape forms, and they get the ability to wild shape as a bonus action. You can also spend your spell slots to heal while in wild shape. That's not really that important, usually, because um, healing in combat is typically not relevant. Uh, you can heal more efficiently by not wasting your spell slots, and you'll often want to be exiting wild shape before entering a, a combat anyway, so you can cast one of your powerful concentration spells and then re-enter wild shape later on. Be the ability to wild shape as a bonus action is, of course, incredibly good for this, because it means that you can cast uh, one of your spells and then wild shape in the same turn at the start of combat, so you're not wasting a whole turn entering wild shape the way the other druid forms would be if they wanted to use the same play pattern. They also get a bunch of really good additional wild shape options. Um, the the Sabertooth Tiger is very good, and the Myrmidons are excellent at later levels. You'll often still want to be an Owlbear in the uh, mid-game, but the Myrmidons, even though they cost two wild shape charges, do tons of damage. As an Earth Myrmidon, you can still benefit from Tavern Brawler, and although I believe this is bugged, they do uh, way more damage than it says on the tooltip. Tool um, wild shape Druids, of course, also make use of Tavern Brawler, which is one of the most broken mechanics in the game, uh, because all of your wild shape form attacks, except for the the non-Earth Myrmidons, count as unarmed attacks, and now benefit fully from Tavern Brawler as of patch 6, gaining both double to hit and double to damage. Um, you can use an Elixir of Strength and still benefit from the full benefits of that while in wild shape, meaning you can use any wild shape form with the Tavern Brawler. So it is just an incredibly powerful melee combatant does lots of damage, as well as just having all of the druid's normal spell access. However, the one thing that Moon Druid will suffer from is not having the burst damage that other dedicated melee damage dealers do. So in the late game, you are going to fall behind, say, an Action Surging Fighter or a Paladin Smite, um, in terms of burst damage, and this game is heavily tilted towards burst damage. So Wild Shape, uh, Moon Druid, and Moon Druid's Wild Shape forms great sustained damage. I don't know why that was so hard to say, but <laughs> bear with me. Uh, matters a little less than you might think because they don't have access to the same incredible burst damage as more dedicated burst damage dealers. That being said, they're still just uh, an incredibly powerful class. You get to use the Druid's core play pattern as well as anybody by casting a spell entering wild shape and then in subsequent turns just attacking with your wild shape forms. Uh, you get to abuse one of the most broken mechanics in the game in the form of Tavern Brawler. You get all of the summons and everything that druids normally get. I believe that Moon Druid is an S tier subclass. Spore Druid. Spore Druid is, I think, one of the subclasses that changes the play pattern of the character the most. So a Spore Druid plays out differently from the other two, more differently from the other two Druids than any other subclass plays from the other subclasses in its uh, class. Spore Druids get a number of different things, but the most important one, or sort of the core component of the subclass, is that you can use your wild shape charges to activate Symbiotic Entity, which gives you four temporary hit points per druid level. So at max level, that's going to be 48 temporary hit points. And while those temporary hit points are active, you deal, deal an extra d6 damage with all of your attacks. You also get a reaction damaging 
effect that allows you to use your reaction proactively, which is the only way in the game to use your reaction proactively, at least as a class ability, um, to do a little bit of additional damage, uh, which is not irrelevant. It just increases the damage output of your character significantly. However, for a character that's focused on dealing attack damage, you don't get extra attack. So you are not going to be dealing as a solo class spore druid, you will not be dealing as much damage as a dedicated melee damage dealer. And typically you're going to want to have high wisdom anyways, rather than high dexterity or high strength, because you are going to to make those attacks, because you want to actually land your spells. You're still primarily going to be a spellcaster. You can mitigate that somewhat with items, but in general, spore druids bring some multi-attribute dependency back into druids, who otherwise are basically attribute independent since they'll use their wild shape forms attributes rather than their humanoid forms attributes spore druids need to actually have good attributes and so compete uh one of the major advantages of druids that they don't really compete for items with the rest of your party is negated by having a spore druid that being said, what you get for Spore Druid is pretty good. You get a lot of damage, you get a lot of temporary hit points. You also get Bone Chill as a cantrip at level 2, which I think is actually a pretty major boost to the class. One of Druid's major weaknesses is that they don't have access to a good 60-foot range cantrip. Bone Chill's one of the best ones. I rated it S tier in my... Um, or A tier, I think, in my cantrips tier list. Um, top tier, anyways. One of the, the top three cantrips in the game... Uh, alongside Eldritch Blast and Ray of Frost, and it will give you a great option that actually smooths out your play patterns a lot, because you're going to be spending a lot of time in humanoid form. Having a good cantrip makes the game a lot easier to play, um, and Spore Druid gets that. You might seem you might be a little surprised that I'm spending so much time talking about the one cantrip access, but I actually think it smooths out your game in play significantly, and so actually will impact your play much more than you think it will, just to have a great cantrip available to a druid, where that is one of the main weaknesses of the character. You also, of course, get uh, spore zombies and get animate dead as a bonus spell, so you get to have a whole bunch of skeletons and zombies running around and can make a gigantic army. If you are building around a summons build, of course, adding a whole bunch of extra summons to the mix is great. If you can get additional buffs on your summons, it's awesome. Um, and you get an AoE damaging spell at level 10 that actually does okay damage because it's it's kind of for free. You can set it up before combat starts, but not worth usually spending an action on if you don't set it up before combat starts starts. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't consider this to be a huge bonus, but it's definitely relevant to have a little bit of extra AoE damage available when you're stacking up AoE damage on top of a CC'd enemy. Overall, Spore Druid gives you uh, some access to some okay additional spells, um, access to a decent defensive class feature, although as a defensive class feature, it's worse than just wild shaping. You get more hit points out of wild shaping. Uh, but also just gives you your own personal army, which is, of course, incredibly strong. I think that for most play with druids, you're better off just going for one of the other two druid classes. If you want to play a spellcasting-focused druid, you should just play a land druid. If you want to play uh, a wild shape-focused druid, you should play a moon druid. But spore druid has its own unique and powerful play style. Um, if you can stand microing around all the summons, it's of course incredibly powerful. Uh, but it does suffer a little bit from being monoclassed, because you can't easily get bonus attacks, which is one of the best ways to use the symbiotic entity bonus damage, which is one of the core features of Spore Druid. As a mono class, class I think Spore Druid is an A-tier character, just an, an excellent character that will do very well in any party, but not quite on the level of the S-tier uh, classes uh, above it. Fighters. So I rated Fighter A tier in my classes tier list, but I will say that before we go into rating the individual subclasses that the classes tier list was more heavily tilted towards versatility, which is one of the things that fighters excel at, and this one is a little more heavily tilted towards power level, so you might see fighters place a little bit differently um, than, than they place in the raw class tier list. We'll start with Battlemaster Fighter, which gets a whole bunch of uh, maneuvers. So you get four combat superiority dice going up to five at level seven, but you never get more than five, and they recharge on short or long rest and allow you to make attack maneuvers. These maneuvers include making your attacks more likely to land, tripping enemies, pushing enemies, causing enemies to stand still, um, which is very powerful for a ranged version of this build, uh, and 
various other effects, but those are sort of the main ones. If you look at any of my Battlemaster build guides, you'll see which of the maneuvers I think are good. The, those abilities are very powerful because you, they are used as weapon attack actions, so you can do multiple of them in a turn. Um, as if you have mo more than one attack in a turn, which as a fighter you will have more than one attack in a turn, and they add your superiority die to damage, so they let you do powerful control effects while also doing as much damage as you were going to do with a normal weapon attack. That's a very powerful effect, but it does burn through resources pretty quickly. With only five superiority dice at max level, if you use them at... Uh, at the maximum rate that you could, you would be using your superiority dice up in a single turn of combat if you use precision attack plus another maneuver, and you're, you'll often want to use precision attack plus another maneuver on most of your attacks, then in a single round of combat, a single action making three fighter attacks, you've used all of your superiority dice for that short rest. That makes battle masters very greedy for resources, so while the effects are extremely strong, a battle master fighter is going to... Um, eat through their resources very quickly and be relying on just the the, pa the base power of the fighter class. That said, those effects are very good, and Battlemaster fighters just being fighters, getting action surge, getting three attacks per round is really solid and just lets them do lots and lots of damage. You can just build your Battlemaster fighter as a normal damage character and ignore the maneuvers and they'll do great. Just the fact that they get three attacks per round is super powerful and in a mono class setup is more than enough just to make them an A tier class. The maneuvers are also excellent, don't get me wrong, but it will eat into your party longevity. Um, but they're just uh, Battlemaster is just a great class. I think that Battlemaster alongside Wildheart Barbarian is the standard of balance around which Baldur's Gate 3 should be balanced. The, the default balancing for those two classes is, I think, basically perfect. And they will be a great addition to any honor mode party and will help you go through um, the game very easily while not wildly overpowering everything that uh, is put in front of you. Champion. So Champion basically gets three class features. Um, they get technically four, but one of them does almost literally nothing. Uh, they get improved critical hit, giving them an additional crit threshold of one, so they're 5% more likely per attack to critically hit, slightly more if you have advantage. And they get a 10-foot bonus at level 7. They get an additional 10-foot distance to their jump distance, which is not irrelevant. It makes you a little more mobile in combat. Um, and they also get to add basically half their proficiency, uh, so bards, jack of all trades, but only for strength decks and con checks, um, so skill, skill checks. And that is a tiny bonus that doesn't do anything because you're fighter is guaranteed to be already proficient in athletics and you're not having them roll stealth checks or open locks anyways so getting half proficiency in those skills is completely useless and then uh, also they get an additional fighting style at level 10. Fighting style is a nice little bonus it's plus one AC or a little bit of extra damage dice something like that um, but of course any, th any fighting style that's core to your character you'll have taken at level one when you took your first fighter level. So this is only going to be a tiny little numerical bonus, usually plus one AC. To do understand whether champion fighter is good or not, we have to do some math around improved critical hits. So an improved critical hit uh, makes you 5% more likely per attack to do a critical hit. Critical hits double the damage dice that your weapon attacks do. And so basically improved critical hit is worth 5% of your base damage dice per attack. You can increase it a little bit, because sometimes you'll have advantage, although with no inbuilt way to gain advantage on this character, you won't be triggering it as easily, unless you're using like the Risky Ring or something like that. But um, with no inbuilt way to gain advantage on fighters, you are most of the time just increasing your damage dice by 5%. A typical setup might be, say, a Greatsword for 2d6 damage, or average of 7, plus uh, Gloves for 2d4, or, or for a d4, that'll give you another 2.5, and, and then let's say you get a, a d6 from another item and then your weapon has a couple extra dice on top of it another d6 on top of that so let's say that you're doing i don't know 4d6 plus 2d4 damage um that seems reasonably fair that's a that would be a relatively high uh, setup for for base damage dice um just for weapon attacks but seems fair to 
look at for that. Um, and we're going to say, so that's uh, 19 base damage from damage dice. 5% of 19 is less than one damage per attack that you're getting from your class feature. Compare that to what battle masters get, where they are just adding a D8 to uh, attacks as they go, and you need to make a lot of attacks before you catch up to a battle master's damage based on the improved critical hit class feature. You probably need to make something like 20 attacks before you even catch up, and you're not getting any of the other bonus effects. Um, the numbers on this class feature just don't work out. It's a very small amount of additional damage that you are getting from it, especially as a monoclass character, but we'll talk about them for multi-class builds later on. Um, the additional critical hit threshold is just not uh, going to add up to enough damage over the course of the game to justify taking this class, and there's no reason you would ever take this class over Battlemaster, which just gets more damage and has the CC effects and everything as well, um, giving you a bunch of additional combat options. Champion is just uh, outclassed by the other two fighter classes because the numbers just don't add up for it. In order to fix Champion, and I kind of want to do a, like, how would I fix these outclassed subclasses uh, section for each of these. Um, in order to fix Champion, I think it just needs, like, two more abilities. Um, either an, a, something like Barbarian's Brutal Critical to go with the improved critical hit bonus. Or more likely, just some kind of rider effect on its attacks. Like, you could add an extra d6 to your, uh, as a capstone ability, you could add an extra d6 to all your attacks, which would be kind of cool, like it would multiply with the critical hit section, and it would bring its damage more in line with the other fighter subclasses. That's just speculation, though. Obviously, I'm not a, a Dungeons & Dragons designer, but that's where I would start if I was going to fix this class. As it stands, I don't recommend taking it unless you think the, the concept sounds cool, although why would you? It's by far the most boring fighter class, um, because the numbers just don't add up to the other subclasses. Eldritch Knight. Um, so Eldritch Knight, I think, is a very misunderstood class because it's presented as the as a class that you're supposed to do a combination of weapon attacks and spell casts with. You get evocation spells on it, so you can like theoretically do damage with evocation spells. But of course, as a martial character, your your save DCs will not be good, so you're not going to be doing damage with the uh, the evocation spells regularly because enemies will be making their saves and um, you are always going to just do more damage just by attacking. In fact, one of their main class features, the uh, War Magic class feature, which lets you make a weapon attack as a bonus action after casting a cantrip, will almost always, uh, in a, almost 100% of the time, decrease your damage output if you activate this class feature. You should never cast an aggressive cantrip with, with Eldritch Knight, because you have a, a weapon. You can just hit things with your weapon for way more damage than you would be doing using War Magic. War Magic does have a use with Blade Ward, because it lets you cast Blade Ward while still outputting damage, which is a pr uh, pretty useful ability. But in general, Eldritch Knight, I think, is misunderstood and often misplayed, because people try to take control spells or damage spells and then run into the fact that you just have low save DCs on the character, when really what Eldritch Knight is for is just being a, a base class fighter, which is a very good thing to be, doing lots of weapon damage, and getting some of the best utility spells in the game to fill out the character. You also get two major, like Berserker Barbarian, or the other uh, class that as a mono class benefits most or is most drawn towards throwing weapons. And so we can't evaluate the subclass without talking about Tavern Brawler throwing weapons and how broken those are in general. If you're playing a mono class build, Eldritch Knight is the way to go for Tavern Brawler Thrower because you get more attacks per round than the Berserker version of the Tavern Brawler Thrower. And that's just going to be an incredible amount of damage output. And in fact, if you are new to Honor Mode, I think that an Eldritch Knight Tavern Brawler Thrower, like the build that I posted called the Consistent Killer, um, is the most reliable way to win Honor Mode. You will have the by far the easiest path through Honor Mode using that build of basically any other class. The reason for this is that Eldritch Knight gets all of the great defensive and utility spells uh, available to other classes while being a top-tier damage output character, and of course because you you can be a thrown weapon character using any thrown weapon, you can do massive damage based on Tavern Brawler, you can also just build them as a normal normal great weapon fighter or just any other normal fighter, but you get the addition of shield at level 1, misty step later on, um, and a bunch of other 
awesome utility spells, these spells together make your character very, very hard to kill. Just being a, a heavy armor character with the shield spell means that you are regularly going to have AC near 30, making you basically impossible to hit for most enemies. And so you can mess up a lot. You can, you can afford to make a lot of mistakes without your Eldritch Knight getting into trouble. The combination of that... Um, and the fact that you also are a natural character for one of the most broken uh, mechanics in the game, the thrown weapon uh, tavern brawler fighter, uh, combined with the fact that I think this is the easiest character to play it through honor mode with, or one you know to have in your party for honor mode, means that I'm going to put Eldritch Knight in S tier. Uh, but with the caveat that you don't actually use its abilities the way the, the design of the class seems to intend you to use them, just use it as a normal fighter that gets a bunch of extra utility spells added on and use it as a thrown weapon fighter. And that will basically just being a fighter with shield makes this character so smooth and easy to play. I think it will take you through the game very easily. All right, my friends, we all saw this coming. I have now talked for well over an hour about these subclasses and I really do want to keep these videos from going too long so I'm going to make the cut here and we will uh, resume later. Um, one of the things that I think is really cool about what we're seeing so far is that you can see party comps shaping up pretty easily. For example if you were to build a monoclast party uh, I think that a, a lore bard, a light cleric, a moon druid, and an eldritch knight um, just picking from the S tier classes would be a solid monoclass party that would have a lot of ability to defend each other, good variety of skills, great damage output, great control, um, very safe play patterns because you have lots of extra HP from the Moon Druid and Shield plus cutting words and, and so on. Uh, and so I think that it's kind of neat that you can see those uh, resolving as we go through these classes. As always, of course, if you think that there's something that I should move around, don't hesitate to let me know in the comments. I definitely have made adjustments based on people's feedback in the past, and so I am very open to doing so in the future if there's something you think, if there's a, a subclass you think should be moved around. I'm also looking forward to seeing if we get more use out of B and C tiers. I was actually expecting a few more classes to go into those when I started going through this, um, but I think that this speaks really well so far of the, the balance of the subclasses in Baldur's Gate 3. I think everything being around A or S tier is what you want, and it looks like that's where most uh, classes are going to fall. All right, my friends, hope you've enjoyed the video, and of course, as always, if you have, feel free to leave a comment uh, and like the video. Both of those things help a ton with the algorithm, and you can subscribe to my channel for more of this and other strategy game content. And if you'd like to support me and my channel further, uh, you can, of course, feel free to do so by becoming a channel member or making a donation with the buttons below the video. I do appreciate those very much, and thank everyone who has chosen to do so. Cheers, my friends. I'll catch you next time.